Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out this morning on this beautiful Colorado day with a little bit of snow, and we sincerely appreciate your interest. I'd like to acknowledge our mayor, uh, Russell Stewart, and our city manager, Chris Kramer. Uh, we certainly appreciate their support of the police department. I brought you all here because I'd like to inform you all that there has been an arrest of a suspect in the August 4th, 1981 murder of Miss Sylvia Quayle. She was found murdered in her Cherry, Cherry Hills Village home. Her picture is on the monitor here. I am proud to be able to tell Sylvia's sister and brother-in-law that the men and women of our department have anticipated the opportunity to make this announcement for almost 40 years. First and foremost, our thoughts are with you, the family. We can only try to understand the deep pain and sense of loss you've experienced over the years. I am pleased that there is a path moving forward to seek justice in her death. I would like to take a moment to remind everyone of the type of person who was lost to our community here in Cherry Hills Village and to her family on August 4, 1981. Sylvia's sister and family had the quote, beauty scene is never lost, etched onto her grave marker a very fitting reminder of the beautiful person she was. She was 34 years old at the time of her death. Sylvia graduated from Inglewood High School. She was ambitious, vibrant, friendly, and lit up the room when she walked in. She had a lot of friends that she would given her last dollar to if they would have needed it. Sylvia was a history buff who enjoyed researching the work of her architect uncle, Wesley Quayle. Sylvia worked at an architect firm and was very active in the Architect Secretary Association. She was a very good cook and opened a small business called The Buttery, which specialized in wedding cakes. <clears throat> she also had an artistic flair and created many beautiful pottery pieces of uh, flower vases and bowls. Her sister still has many of them in the home that they live in now. She loved her little sister very much. And lastly, for this portion, Sylvia had a wonderful, loving relationship with her parents and had coffee with them every morning. They missed her deeply. So you see a lot of people with me up here this morning. There are so many individuals to thank. This was truly a team effort that spanned the course of almost 40 years. And when you think about that, that's truly remarkable, uh, that folks that came before me, before other detectives, still kept this case on the front burner and never gave up on it. So I'd like to thank those detectives and other people from the uh, Cherry Hills P Village Police Department, technicians, past chiefs, whoever, for their assistance. I'd like to thank the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, uh, both for their assistance at the time of the murder back in 81, but also for the follow-up over the years uh, and recently. Uh, we have Director uh, John Camper with us today, and forensic scientist Missy Woods, and we appreciate uh, their diligence with helping us with this case. In January of 2020, we developed a partnership with Metro Crime Stoppers and United Data Connect that led, led to new information regarding the case and a person of interest. More investigative work followed, and an arrest warrant was obtained in January of 2021. I'd like to thank Mitch Morrissey, the co-founder, and Joan, the investigative genetic genealogist of United Data Connect for their assistance with this case. I'd also like to thank board chairman of Crime Stoppers, Mike Mills. I'd also like to thank Detective Lenny Abeda from the Cherry Hills Village Police Department and investigator Matt Hannigan from the District Attorney's Office. They were instrumental in putting all the pieces together, together to make a prosecutable case. And we certainly couldn't be doing this without the assistance of the 18th Judicial District. I'd like to thank District Attorney John Kellner, Senior uh, Deputy Chief Assistant District Attorney Chris Wilcox, and Chief Deputy District Attorney Chris Gallo. These gentlemen will be moving this case forward as the court system continues here. And then finally, I'd like to thank a couple of agencies from Nebraska who in the last couple of months were very helpful to us. First would be Sheriff Ken Moody and members of the Dawson County Sheriff's Office, and then also the COZAD Police Department, Chief Mont Mark, excuse me, Montgomery and Officer Nick Reynolds. 
So now I'd like to take an opportunity to provide you with some information about the suspect, if you would check the monitor. I want to remind everyone that criminal charges are merely a formal accusation that an individual has committed a crime. A defendant is presumed innocent until proven guilty. You're looking at a picture of David Dwayne Anderson. His date of birth is October 7th of 1958. The first photograph is of Anderson in 1980. If anyone recognizes this photograph of him from this time period and has information surrounding or involving this case, we ask that you please call the Cherry Hills Village Police Department tip line at 720-305-9831. The second is the booking photograph that was taken in, the, at, in Nebraska at the time of his arrest. Anderson was arrested on February 10th in Dawson County, Nebraska, and is currently being held on the Cherry Hills Village warrant for first degree murder. A court proceeding was held yesterday in Nebraska, and Anderson agreed to waive extradition. No court dates will be scheduled in Colorado until he is physically present at the Arapahoe County Detention Center. So at this time, I'd like to um, let a couple members back here that, that would like to make a few comments come up. They'll introduce themselves, and then we'll move on from there. Morning, everyone. My name is John Kellner. I'm the district attorney for the 18th Judicial District that covers Arapahoe, Douglas, Elbert, and Lincoln counties. I am extremely honored uh, to be able to stand in front of you today and talk about this extraordinary police work that has identified a suspect and that will hopefully shortly bring this suspect to the state of Colorado to face the charges. Now, I want to reiterate something that the chief said early on, which is that this defendant is presumed innocent. We take that very seriously and hope you do as well. I'd also want to recognize the incredible work, teamwork really, by so many folks involved that have brought us to this day. As the Chief mentioned, so many incredible detectives and other partners in the police force throughout Cherry Hills Village Police Department worked this case diligently since 1981. Along the way, they've been helped by many different folks from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and most recently, the incredible team that Mitch Morrissey has assembled at United Data Connect to help bring this case to where we are today. I'd also want to thank Crime Stoppers for constantly putting this case at the forefront by trying to engage the community and solicit tips and information to help solve this case. I'll tell you a few things uh, that we expect to happen process-wise with respect to this defendant. As the chief mentioned, he has waived extradition, so we anticipate he will arrive in the state of Colorado in short order. We do not have a specific time frame for that. Of course, we have always concerns about security and specifics of transport of individuals, so we're not going to discuss those specifics. Once he arrives here in the state of Colorado, uh, he will be prosecuted on charges of first degree murder. We anticipate the formal filing of those charges shortly. Now, one word about uh, first-degree murder as it existed in 1981. As it existed in 1981, the crime of first-degree murder, if convicted, carried with it a penalty of life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. That differs than what we have now, which is a conviction of first-degree murder would carry an automatic life in prison sentence without the possibility of parole. The charges we proceed under are that basically the law that existed in 1981. Again, I am extremely grateful to be able to stand here and be able to seek justice on behalf of Sylvia Quayle, and that is solely due to the hard work of so many people over so many years. And so my message to any victims or family members of victims out there is this. This team will never stop seeking justice for you. This team will never stop trying to identify people who have taken members of our community away. This team will always continue that pursuit of justice and to keep hope. Thank you.
Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Mike Mills, and I'm the board president of Metro Denver Crime Stoppers. Two years ago, Mitch Morrissey and I had a conversation, and our mission at Metro Denver Crime Stoppers is to assist law enforcement in providing information anonymously to law enforcement from the community. And Mitch and I were talking, we've been very successful over the last 40 years, but we weren't doing anything towards cold cases. And Mitch came to me and said, Mike, would you be willing with your board to fund five pilot programs around cold case and genetic genealogy? And I said, Mitch, it sounds great. We will commit, at the time it was $15,000, to, or I think $20,000 at the time, to these first five cases. Happily, now we've solved all five cases with the help of Joan and Mitch and the, our law enforcement team. We have nine cases that were open, so we continued with, two, with four more, two of which have, so seven of nine so far, with hopefully good news on the last two coming soon. That's within two years. Sylvia Quayle was one of the first five, and um, a person of interest was named early on, but it took a lot more diligent law enforcement work, and thanks to Lenny Abeda, Cherry Hills Police Department, and Investigator Matt Hannigan for their hard work. Our partnership with UDC has been tremendous. We hope to continue to do this. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit all volunteer board, and so our funding is all through private donations. We would appreciate if this is something that is interesting interests you to reach out to Metro Denver Crime Stoppers and donate towards cold cases. We've shown the success has been great, and I want to thank all of you today for having me here. I'm Mitch Morrissey. I'm the former Denver District Attorney, and now I'm uh, Chief Operating, Chief of Operations of United Data Connect. And I want to thank the Chief. I've met with the Chief now a couple of times, and I want to thank her for making us part of the solution here today. Uh, I've got to tell you, Mike talked about the five cases that uh, Crime Stoppers said they would partner with us on. One of them we, we solved up in Jefferson County. And there's a young DNA analyst up there. She used to work in Denver. She said, Mitch, if you have a slot, I worked on a case when I worked at CVI. It's a homicide down in Cherry Hills. And if you would contact Detective Abeda, I'm sure he would love your help. And so she's not here today. But that's the way that forensic DNA analysts in this state work and remember and care about the cases they worked on. It was because of her I called Detective Abeda, who probably didn't know about our program at the time, with Crime Stoppers backing, and he jumped on the opportunity to be the fifth case. So I want to thank him for that. You know, as an old prosecutor, and I am getting old, um, to meet Sylvia's family today means a lot to me. And um, when I read this case and realized that her father found her in the condition that I know she was in, the way that she was left after being brutalized and killed, I can't imagine, as a father myself, of a young woman about this age, to have a morning like that. And I know he's not here, and for me, that's part of the hardest part of solving these 40-year-old cases, and we've solved quite a few of them now, is that some of the people that want answers, that need closure, they don't get it because they're gone. So I'm just proud of the work that we did as part of this case, honored to be part of the team. 
I want to thank Cherry Hills for letting us do this. And uh, there's more work to be done, but I know that the, the DAs will take care of it. Thank you. So that concludes the comments that we have. I don't know if we can try to answer any questions. Yes. I don't know if I, would you like to cover sure. that? Cover. Thank you. Obviously at this stage, we're guided by certain ethical principles that don't allow us to talk about uh, things that are outside the public record. There is an affidavit in this case that has been unsuppressed. Uh, I encourage anyone if they're interested to reach out to the court system to obtain that affidavit if you've not already done so. We can talk about process, um, but we're not gonna talk about motive at this time. You talked a little bit more about what uh, what led you to the suspect. I know you said you didn't have any genealogy. Can you somebody give sort of the basic uh, description of what that is, how it works, and how you got to this guy? Well, what we did was we took the DNA that was found at the crime scene in this case. Uh, there there were more than one sample, but we took one of the samples. And what we're looking for is a single source sample, and so we obtained that through the property bureau here at the police department. We took that and we got it sequenced, which is a different form of DNA analysis than what you're used to in criminal cases. We got it sequenced. Once we sequenced it, then we uploaded that data to two different general open source websites, Family Tree DNA and GEDmatch. And we started to then get connected people that were related to the individual that we were looking for. Uh, Detective Abeda did an incredible job, in fact, took a trip down to, I believe it was Montrose, on someone that we knew was probably a cousin of sorts, but by getting that person's cooperation in DNA, then we were able to eliminate an entire line of people and then focus further on the individual that we were interested in. The detectives did a lot of work and follow up on the leads that we gave them. Remember, we're giving them investigative leads and they're taking those leads and they're running them down. They don't always find the guy, but they lead then back to us, other, you know, they close doors for us. This, I can just give you an example of the extent of the work of our genealogist. This tree that we used had over 3,300 people in it. So it is extensive background work. We use DNA for that. We use all kinds of newspapers, public records, find out about these people and who they're related to, and eventually get it down to one suspect. And we get their DNA. If it matches the crime scene sample, then it gets presented to the DNA, to the district attorney for a determination if charges are appropriate or not. Other questions? Yes. Well, I think, uh, like uh, Mr. Kellner said, I think what Lenny would have to offer right now would be probably be very specific, but he's certainly welcome to make a couple of comments if he would like to. Okay. <laughs> that does not surprise me. <laughs> a lot of things have surprised me in the last couple of months. That does not. So I think as we move forward, certainly we'll, you know, we'll be taking care of other specific questions. You know, I, do, I don't have information uh, about that. I can tell you that he was living in Cozad, uh, which is in uh, Dawson County. I don't have a lot on his background right now. Do you know what the last time, I think he has a criminal record in Colorado, correct? I believe so, yes. Do you know when the last, roughly when the last time he was arrested? Anywhere? Do you? 
You, what was it for? Come on up, Matt. <laughs> we'll do it this way. Sorry, Matt Hannigan. His last arrest was in 1989. In Colorado. Yes. And do you have any sense of working? Had he been working in Nebraska? How long had he been in Nebraska? Was he living a quiet life? I don't have a significant amount of details. He was certainly employed at the time of his arrest. He was employed? Employed. He was employed? Yes, sir. Living in a small town in Nebraska? I believe that was a small town. Do you know if he had family? What's that? Would he marry children? I don't know all that information. Sorry. Yeah, and, and again, because our investigation is ongoing, I don't want to comment on those things. Okay. Thank you, though. Can you, with the, um, her, Sylvia's sister and her brother-in-law, where do they live? Are they still in Colorado? I'll take care of that. They are residents of the city of Cherry Hills Village. And uh, I've been in very close contact with them. Uh, absolutely wonderful people who um, really sometimes just don't quite have the words for what's gone on in the sense of 39 plus years. And uh, I just know that they're definitely very grateful uh, that Sylvia was never forgotten. And then Chief, you sort of alluded to it in your initial remarks, but can you just tell us how this case has touched you personally? Well, I would have to take a very long, deep breath um, because I agree with Mitch. I don't, I don't know how you're not a little bit emotional, no matter who you are. I became chief here in 2012, and I can tell you that one of the things I did was ask my commander, Pat Weathers, uh, who's been here since 1981, by the way, uh, was not here for this event, started about four months later, uh, for background, you know, what happens, what goes on, and um, this is a very tight-knit community, and um, people have been curious. I can tell you that I received an email last night uh, from a person, she said she was eight years old, at the time of this event and that through the course of her life she's gotten on the internet tried to find out has anything happened couldn't find anything and she was so grateful and that's exactly what she said that 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 this case hadn't been forgotten um, so in the course of my time here since 2012 I know that uh, whenever the district attorney's office and there's been different district attorneys in, in that time uh, George Brockler, uh, um, we also had conversations with uh, Mark Hurlbert at the time. Anytime anybody ever wanted to talk about this case, they came down to the PD, we opened it up, what would you like to talk about, what would you like to look at, and we just tried to keep moving forward. And so when um, uh, Detective Abeta took the call from Mitch Morrissey and was explaining this process, I have to be honest with you, he comes into my office and He's trying to explain genetic genealogy to Chief Tovere, and I'm, okay, well, let's, let's talk about it. Let's see what it looks like. And so we invited Mitch down uh, along with Joan, and they sat and talked to us about it, and it was just an instant yes to, to get to where we are today. So um, even in the small time I've been here, it's, it's been a journey. And, uh, and then getting to know uh, Joe and understanding... Uh, being a little sister and what Sylvia meant to her, it's uh, it's uh, it's a little breathtaking. So, yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, which were there law enforcement agencies in Nebraska that were involved with taking the suspects into custody? Yes, that would have been uh, Dawson County. I think helped out the most, but we also had worked with the COZAD Police Department prior to that. I was so that was a good way to put that thank you um, I started at the Lakewood Police Department in 1983 so no I, I, I was not I was not aware of this case but I was aware of some of the other cases that Mr. Mr. Morrissey talked about back in the day yeah anything else anything else from the group so I would like to uh, uh, just end this by again thanking you all um, 
for being here and showing interest in this case. It's very important. Uh, like Mr. Kellner said, uh, we're not the only one here. The solving of these cases through this type of, of uh, technology has not stopped. Um, I hope other chiefs get the opportunity to stand here as, as I have today. And, um, and we want other families to feel um, the progress that we've made here today with, uh, with Sylvia. And um, I think that's the most important thing that, that you can take out of this day with us today is to take a look at her picture and uh, to know this was about her. So, yes. Well, I think I'll let them do that for you so you can put name to paper. But again, thank you all for being here today. I'm John Camper, director of CBI. Danny Garaki with Metro Denver Crime Stoppers. I'm Joan, the genealogist for United Data Connect. Thank you. I think that's everybody. Yeah. Right?